The team has three objectives for today's webinar. One, we will explore the assessment program evaluation cycle. Two, we will analyze the assessment program with aligned achievement levels in multi-test analysis. And three, we're gonna review findings in test analytics and single test analysis. The agenda for today, we will discuss the importance of assessment evaluation. We will review quick views, uh, multi-test analysis, and how to triangulate with single test analysis. And with that, I would like to send it over to Jeremy to get us started. Jeremy, take it away. All right, friends, uh, today we are a small but mighty crowd, but I'd like to get us started by throwing something into the chat here. We've got an icebreaker question. Fall break is just around the corner. What are you looking forward to most? Is that A, vacation plans, B, uh, to actually get started on that reading list, uh, a little typo there, we'll see if we can clean that up later before we release it, C, all the food, so much food, or D, hitting the snooze button for a little bit. What are y'all looking forward to most? Throw that into the chat there. There we go. D, hitting snooze. C for me, so much food. Armando, I'm with you. A, getting that vacation in there from John. Dixie, D, hitting snooze. B from Sharice, getting down that reading list. Awesome. Very good. Thank you all for uh, uh, getting some of that in there for us. <clears throat> so over the last few sessions of our webinar series over assessment and assessment programs, we've been looking at the assessment feedback cycle, trying to answer the question, we just took a test, so now what? Today, we're going to spend a little bit of time breaking out of the individual assessment uh, feedback cycle and look at a feedback cycle for your entire assessment system or your assessment program. Remember, we talked about establishing your assessment system in part one of this series, and so I'm going to refer you back to that session if you feel like you missed anything in particular. But also recall that effective feedback is fed with decisions based on evidence. And breaking out of the assessment feedback cycle and moving into the assessment system feedback cycle, <clears throat> pardon me, I want to review the entire system as a whole to decide if changes to your assessment system are actually required. So <clears throat> I've changed the format of our cycle here to make it a little more digestible. And we don't have it actually in a cycle or a circle like we had it in the last cycle, but instead as a series of steps. So to begin, step one, the students are taking the test. This is normal processes for most of us and nothing unusual to talk about here other than trying to make sure and ensure that your processes have actually been built to ensure a fair and practical assessment program. But I want to call out the importance of looking across assessments when we're actually evaluating the assessment system. We spent quite a bit of time in our webinar series talking about individual assessments, but today we're going to be going to dive in a little bit into a different lens and look at assessments side by side to draw conclusions. The next step is an ongoing process throughout the school year. Note that the arrows to the right of this section, it requires a process or series of processes that incorporate regular check-ins on assessment data. This can be collaborative data meetings, it can be instructional coaches reviewing assessment data, it can be district level data digging, it can be any number of things and a combination of those things. But <clears throat> stakeholders need to be involved with monitoring assessment data over time. Now, we might consider the evaluation of those metrics to be a part of uh, the analysis step, the prior step, but I've separated it out as step three to actually ensure that analysis happens at that level versus the process of actually evaluating what you're seeing using a variety of tools and approaches to look at things that help with evaluating assessment validity and reliability. And I'll pause there because those are two buzzwords, assessment validity and reliability. They're often meddled up. Validity and reliability, while related, are different in that validity in terms of assessment validity is how well is one assessment predicting the outcomes of another assessment? Is your assessment valid in that it's predicting outcomes? Whereas reliability is how well is the assessment internally doing what you think it's supposed to be doing? And we're going to be doing, uh, we'll be looking at both of those lenses here in just a little bit. But we have to ask ourselves questions in this step about what is the data telling me? Have I run it through all of the contexts required to understand what is happening with the information that we're seeing? Are we going, or we're going to take a deeper dive into that step here in just a few minutes. 
As part of the evaluating assessment metrics, we also have to call out the importance of reflecting on instructional practices. This is a call out on local context as it may be the most important piece. And really, if we're being honest, it is the most important piece. Assessments can be well written and then get flagged in a number of metrics and, and look like it might be something wrong when evaluating reliability and validity without it meaning that an assessment is necessarily good or bad. Statistics only tell you so much. It's the instruction that really makes the biggest difference when it comes to running these things through those lenses. After that, we reevaluate your system's assessment goals. Are you incorporating formative assessment practices that are benefiting students in their learning? Are your summative assessments built in ways that are substantive to the learning process? Are your teachers familiar with the purpose of each assessment and the general assessment practices that you've established in your district? Use what you've learned to make decisions and really then go into the next step. Did you find any gaps in your program? And if so, how do you plan on addressing them? And then execute a plan to address them. We go through that process and then link everything either to build out or find professional development to bridge those gaps. That professional development can be embedded into the school year or as part of the back to school PD. But at the end, teachers and other stakeholders need to know what's changed or what they need to change after your assessment. So as I mentioned before, analyzing the test data over time, it's an ongoing process that we discuss uh, setting up the processes for in parts two and three of this webinar series. However, it's worth stopping and asking yourselves in your processes, are you analyzing data on assessments on a unit by unit basis, or are you stacking up a few uh, assessments at a time and then analyzing them? Neither practice is necessarily good or bad or better than the other, but it does need to be systematic. It's a matter of checking the vital signs throughout the year for your assessment program rather than doing an autopsy at the end of the year. But there is an important aspect of analyzing data across assessments to really get a good look at the overall health of your program as a whole. Regardless, there has to be processes and systems in place to allow professional educators to sit down and review assessments, assessment data, and then draw conclusions. And that might be a PLC, a teaming meeting, grade level meetings, etc. So how are you selecting or building assessments being given to your students? If your teachers are just slapping assessments in front of your kids, maybe it's like something they bought from Teachers Pay Teachers, and you don't have an established assessment program or system, then you might need to go revisit part one of this assessment series. That's what the hard stop on the bottom right is about. It's not to say that pre-belts and the things that are purchased are bad, uh, or that assessments purchased from other resources, such as uh, you know, a third-party item bank, are a bad idea, but proceed with caution when thinking about, those, uh, the, about your systems. Poor systems may yield, even with vetted item banks, poor results. But that doesn't also necessarily mean poor results mean bad systems. You have to run it through context. So how are the assessments and the data connected back to the instruction? When looking at the assessments, the lens must always be through the instruction and not solely on the numbers. Assessment data needs to be used as a part of the assessment feedback cycle to inform instruction and facilitate remediation and then fuel enrichment. It's here we have to ask ourselves, is there any portion of that that I just talked about that makes you stop and then grit your teeth a little bit? Are you missing some of the pieces or are you not sure how to answer some of these questions I've asked? If that's so, you need to hit stop here, go back and look at establishing your assessment system rather than evaluating your assessment system. Then with the next step, we evaluate the metrics. First, let's talk about success indicators. Success indicators are the things that you're looking to achieve. And when you look back, you know your assessments, your students and your teachers have been successful. The assessments aren't the point of the system. Success is, instruction is, but assessments help us measure if success has happened. So what signs do you need to put along the path to help you say, yes, so far we've been successful, or perhaps we need to revisit some things. So what do performance levels in your district actually mean? Performance levels are pretty often an indicator of success and where kids fall into these various buckets. Well, performance levels are more than just approaches, meets, and masters. Performance levels are more than just a cut point on an assessment. They should imply a level of performance with the content, the ability to do certain things with the content expectations. If you use the standard did not meet approaches, meets, and masters, understanding what approaches is and isn't and that's not even necessarily passing is a really important thing. Evaluating these indicators as part of the assessment metrics review is a really big step. So what does it look like for a student to achieve that performance level? 
It has to be more than just achieving some raw score or percent score. What verbs are in the content that you're seeing in the classroom and in the assessment? Are those verbs being met? Is the rigor there? We also have to ask ourselves what high levels of performance means and what it looks like for a classroom, your entire grade level or your entire campus. Define those things at each of those levels and ensure people know what that looks like. Have examples. Make sure people can define it if you were to ask them. It's not enough to establish expectations. Your people have to know what those things look like. This can be a very grand for the entire assessment system, but it can all go all the way down to very, very granular in nature at the lesson level and what success looks like for that class period or this small group of students. Look at all of those levels and identify how those things tie into each other. Then we have to identify what does success look like and mean for each student demographic. Equity is a really big part of the education system and an effective assessment system needs to take that into account. However, each demographic might have different targets to achieve in order to say that success definitely has been achieved. One of the key principles with the success indicators here is ensuring that they're actually connected to the assessment system as a whole. We have to take resources into account, including things like your assessment calendar, your scope and sequence, your instructional focus documents, your essential standards, guiding questions, assessment blueprints. These things need to be accessible and available to anyone needing to use them. So here's another great stopping point. Do you not know the answer to these questions or don't know what I'm talking about when I mention some of the resources, such as an assessment blueprint or pacing guide? Take a pause. Go review part one of this webinar series and look at building some of those foundational pieces of an effective assessment program. It's not enough to just provide tests. You have to make sure everything is moving, connected, and relevant. Okay, if you've gotten this far in your review, it's time to reevaluate your assessment goals. Notice I'm not talking about the assessment program goals. I'm talking about the goals for assessing in general. So you have to answer the question, what is the purpose of every single assessment? Each and every assessment may have a different goal in different context. Beginning of the year assessments, for example, have a completely different goal from a unit assessment. Summative assessments, end of semester assessments, they have different goals from unit assessments. Formative assessments have different purposes from end of year or uh, end of unit assessments. Each assessment has a different purpose and that purpose is extremely important to understand when analyzing that information and the data, what it is you're actually looking for and looking at. I'm gonna use a really big example. Would it make sense for a beginning of the year test that covers content you haven't even taught yet to be paired right next to a unit test to determine if the beginning of the year assessment was valid? Probably not because the unit test has been taught, but putting the two next to each other might help you decide if students are growing. So knowing the purpose of each assessment helps you run the lens of your analysis and what you're actually looking for. In general, Typically, an assessment's purpose is to measure the student's ability to work with the content being taught in that classroom. So we can ask ourselves, is it assessing what is actually happening in the classroom or is there no connection at all? And if there's a disconnect, we need to be able to back up a step and look at those metrics and systems. Is the assessment informing instruction? If not, why are you even giving the assessment? Are assessments providing insight into potential performance on something else or some challenge the students are going to face down the road? These are all really important focusing context type questions. So we can also ask ourselves, how does instruction impact or change the assessment? We often ask that question vice versa. Apologize, my dog work there. We often ask that question vice versa, where we say, uh, how is the assessment impacting instruction? I wanna focus on how is instructing a passing impacting your assessment program. Instruction plays a really big role in the success or failure of an assessment and potentially an entire assessment program. The assessment program can help pinpoint areas to change instruction, reinforce good practices, or even rebuild practices that aren't working. But it can also provide a lens into whether or not your assessments are aligned with what's actually happening in the classroom. Almost done with the steps, and then we can dive into some practical examples. Now, let's talk about identifying and addressing assessment gaps. One of the best ways that you can engage in identifying assessment gaps is by looking at data across a spectrum of assessments. Looking at assessments in isolation can provide a ton of valuable information for the unit that that student was engaged in or the content that that test covers. However, when we look at data across a wider range of assessments, including multiple units, the end of year state assessment, 
NWEA map tests, data or anything else that you're using, you can make some very powerful connections and come to some really impressive insights into the overall health of your assessment system, putting them side by side. For instance, if I see massive drops in student performance in certain units or certain times of year, that might tell me something. If I see local assessments are wildly out of sync with the state assessments, that will tell me something else, potentially about rigor or student preparation. We're going to dig into this a little bit with a really targeted example throughout the remainder of our webinar, so hold tight. When we're looking across assessments, where might your gaps actually lay? These are questions you can ask. Are we seeing dips in performance over time, potentially indicating pacing problems? Are, there, are, are all of your assessments maybe saying there's content coverage problems? Maybe we're not getting to the end of the unit coverage. Are you seeing a misalignment between the state test and your local tests? Maybe that could be due to a lack of content alignment or rig rigor mismatching. Don't forget, stop here and ask yourself, if any of this is sounding a little daunting because maybe you haven't determined what assessment pacing might be or should look like, you might need to double check uh, what your assessments are covering and then revisit one of the earlier webinar series or earlier steps in this evaluation process. And then finally, the last step, professional development. The development can be created locally and delivered, which is typically the best option if you have the resources to do so because it includes the local context. However, it can be outsourced either through a service center or through personalized and targeted uh, PD delivery systems from a third party. So what relevant professional development factors might we need to ask ourselves? Do all of the stakeholders we have listed above know how to participate in something like a POC or whatever process you have? Do they actually understand the purpose of the assessment, the purpose of the time to evaluate the data? Do they have access to all of the resources they need? Are they able to look at the data in a quick and efficient manner? Great reflection questions when trying to decide what kind of PD to give. Okay, so that's the overview of the cycle as a whole for evaluating the healthier assessment system. Now I want to talk to you about how you can set up a data template or data view to help you get started on that journey. So I mentioned a few moments ago that you need to look at your assessments across several different types all year long but the ability to do so can be tricky. So when it comes to evaluating metrics, I want to dive into a non-assessment explicit example. If you've been with us when we introduced multi-test analysis a few months back, you, this particular example might be familiar to you. And you might be thinking, oh God, there's math. He's gonna ask me a question about math. I'm not asking a math question. I'm asking a logistics question. In our example, we have a Victor. Victor is traveling to a log cabin for spring break. During his travels, he likes to see exactly how far he's gone in total. He started a log and wrote down all of his traveling for the first day of the trip. He flew from Dallas to Denver, which is 793 miles. He went from the Denver airport to his cabin, which is 17 kilometers. He unpacked inside of the cabin and walked 87 feet. And then he took an afternoon walk and went 2,120 steps. If Victor wants to know how far he went, what is the first step he's going to have to do before he can figure that out? I'd like to pause a second and let you type something into the chat. What do you think has to happen before we can actually figure out how far Victor's gone? This is what we call classroom wait time. I remember being in the classroom and going, let it get awkward a second. Count to 10. Yes. Boom, boom, boom. Three inches in a row. You all got the same uh, general answer, slightly different words. We have to get to the same unit. We have to have some common way of measuring them, right? And that's exactly the challenge we have when we start setting assessments side by side. So one of the largest problems we always encounter when trying to compare performance of students across various types of data from varied assessments, we have to align to a common performance expectation across all different combinations of tests. To do this kind of thing appropriately, districts, many of you people here in this webinar right now, have to do a lot of that data manipulation on your own, which requires the use of a third-party spreadsheet, Excel, Google Sheets, what have you. There's a lot of work involved with setting formulas, exporting, et cetera. So I'm going to show you how you can do that if you're not an Aware Premium customer, because I don't want this to be beneficial only for our Aware Premium people. So I'm gonna show you how to do it with a spreadsheet, but then I'm gonna show you multi-test analysis and single test analysis and show you how you can do the same general kind of thing with potentially a lot less lift. So why is this important? Well, here's an example of several different assessment types, STAR, your local tests in Edgephoria, the MAP tests, interim tests, and even TELPASS. Notice the different metrics. 
There's not a single metric that is in common across all of those tests. Raw scores across almost all of them, but MAP is the only unique one um, that has RIT instead of raw score. And even if we, we use raw score, each raw score range is totally different from assessment to assessment due to the number of questions. And then you have Telpass that has really different things, such as composite scores across the listening, writing, reading, speaking. So how do we take each of these things and try to turn them into one common metric? <clears throat> Before I actually get into showing you an example in a spreadsheet, I want to ask you guys, and you can drop this into the chat, how are you actually doing this right now? Are you exporting the data into a spreadsheet and creating your own scales? Are you transferring the data into a third-party program? Are you just kind of assuming the scales are similar enough that you can do some comparisons, you're kind of gutting it, or you don't really currently compare across different assessment types? Moment of vulnerability, no judgment. Hey, good. Exporting to spreadsheets, creating your own. That can be a daunting task, especially as assessments change from year to year. Anybody else? Good. Another A. So a lot of us are using those spreadsheets. Another A. Okay. So those of you that responded, you're probably going to see something that looks pretty familiar here in just a second. Um, and if you're, uh, if, if I'm a little lucky, maybe I'll show you something um, that might make it a little bit different or easier if you're using a spreadsheet. So when we're using a third-party spreadsheet program, we have to start by building the data in a quick view. And note, there's an asterisk, exporting required asterisk, unless you're using MTA, which is a premium feature. I'll show you the MTA part in here in a minute, but right now I wanna show you the spreadsheet version. So to get started, we typically select one or more assessment in the uh, quick view table, and we start by just getting the test side by side in quick view. Then we have to edit that view and either add more assessments or tweak the data to whatever is best suited for our needs. I covered some of that in previous uh, uh, parts of our webinar series. So if you need some hints on using quick views to, to a little more depth, go look at part two and part three of the series. But I'm gonna skip a few steps and go straight to the exporting. Once you've exported your quick views and you've got the data side by side, I put it here into a Google sheet and it might look something like this. And I've anonymized the data um, that I use. So I've got uh, some anonymous student names and student IDs and no other identifiers in here. but. The tests that I selected were the May 24 star mathematics grade five. And then I chose the grade five math unit one, the grade five math unit five, and then NWEA maps growth from winter. So I've put all these tests side by side so I can try to ask myself some really targeted important questions. Are my local unit tests and the map tests looking similar to how the students are performing on the STAR test. So this is something I would have pulled together at the end of the year after my fifth grade STAR test came in, because I want to know, is my assessment program in a healthy place? Or are there things that I might need to look at and go tweak? So the first thing we do after we've created the data view and got it into a spreadsheet is convert. We go back to Victor's Travels as an example, and I need to pick which metrics am I going to look at for the STAR the unit tests and the map tests to compare to each other and put them on the same scale. Well, I'm gonna use the vocabulary term here, achievement levels, so that instead of performance levels, like I'm used to with maybe the star test and some of our other local tests, achievement levels are the common scaled metric to get kids into performance buckets. And so I have the abbreviations here, AL. So I'm gonna show you an example of the formula. And there's a bigger version in the uh, actual presentation here in a minute, but I wanna explain how I've got this set up. I've got a large if statement. This if statement is basically checking for if this is true, do this. And if it's not true, go to the next statement. So with this one, I'm looking at the cell G3. Well, G3 is way over here with the star test. And I'm looking at raw score. I chose raw score instead of a performance level, but you could easily choose a performance level. But that gets difficult if your star performance levels include uh, did not meet low, did not meet high, approaches low, and approaches high, but your local test assessments don't or the map tests don't. And because the words might not match, the number of actual verbal or, or word written performance levels might not match, using something like a raw score or percent score may make way more sense. So I'm referencing the raw score column. If it's blank, give me a blank. Otherwise, if it's less than 16 as a raw score, throw that student into achievement level one. 
If it's less than 24, put them into achievement level two. If it's, uh, yeah, less than 33, drop them in achievement level four or else put them in a, uh, three or else put them in achievement level four. I've got this set to be only four achievement levels, but you can continue that string of logic all the way to five or even six achievement levels if you need to. Once I have that set, I drag it down for the remainder of the uh, cells in that column, and you've got an instant sorting of students for that assessment into achievement level buckets. Now, using the achievement levels with that common scale, I do the same thing for unit one. But notice, this time, my metrics look a little different. Instead of a raw score, I'm using a percentage, and I'm looking at P3, which is the assessment or the percentage column for that assessment. Now, I'm looking at if it's less than 36%. Put them here less than 51 percent put them here 77 percent put them here with this formula you can cut and paste it and just tweak the cells and tweak the cut points and you can literally do this in a spreadsheet and just drag the formulas down and do that for every assessment with each metric to create your common scales for unit five i did the same thing and then for the map assessments i used their nwea's texas lincoln study you can Google that if you're not familiar with that, but inside of the Texas linking study, they actually give you a table that shows you what the recommended risk scores are for each performance band on the star test. And so I can use those to tweak maybe a little bit if I have more than or less than the number of achievement levels I need, um, but I use those RIT scores to give me similar buckets. And now I've got all of my tests side by side with the same achievement levels. Right here, zoomed into these four columns, I have something really, really, really powerful. I can go student by student and maybe go hide all of these columns off to the left here until I get to the student names. If I've hidden all of those and I get the names right next to my achievement levels, I can look at this particular kid and see they went from AL2 to AL4 and then kind of held steady. That's a big deal. I can see that over time, this student was also very steady. I can see uh, gaps. This student missed some local assessments. I can see, uh, I don't have a, or here we go, I have a kid that kind of climbed and then dipped. And of course, I'm looking at my star test first. I probably would actually have those in reverse um, when I actually did this analysis, if I were actually executing this. This is just an example, but I think you see my point. I can see visually how the students are changing over time individually, which is really great for remediation and intervention. But taking it a step further, I can then de determine how are my achievement levels broken down by percentage across each of these assessments and decide are my local tests or the map assessments predictive of the star test. So when I look at unit one, the formula I have here is I'm actually going through and I'm counting all of the in through this column, all of the AL ones. And I'm dividing that by the number of students that are actually in that column, and it gives me a percentage ratio. So I do that for every respective achievement level within each of those columns for those tests, and then I get a spread, and I can see right off the bat, unit five is very different than the star test. There's a 16% difference in achievement level four for this assessment. There's a 7% difference or so for achievement level three. But if I compare the star with the map assessment, I can see, oh, wrong, uh, wrong uh, key there. If I can compare those two, I can see really easily that these two are actually aligning very, very well. And they're only a couple of percentage points off across the, the board. So if I'm looking for predictivity of the star tests, I can say the map assessments are doing a really excellent job. And then I have enough information here to decide, do I need to go look at unit five. So you can start to see, I'm painting a picture to look at the assessment health, the assessment program's health. And if I expand this and do a lot of assessments side by side, I can do it across years, I can do it across subjects, and I can start seeing patterns that help lead me to ask me the correct questions to start diving in a little bit deeper. So there's those formulas right there. When y'all get a hold of this uh, webinar um, here in a, a day or so, um, you can feel free to steal those and modify them as you need. Um, or if you're an Aware Premium, you can use multi-test analysis. So why am I trying to use multi-test analysis? Multi-test analysis uses the achievement levels, kind of like I just showed you in the spreadsheet, to align your assessment performances and creates visuals for a far quicker and easier analysis of your performance across assessments over time. 
We've also included something called predictive analytics, which helps determine your assessment validity. Again, validity with context. You have to understand what it is the assessment's trying to achieve in order to really uh, look at and analyze those results. And we've controlled multi-test analysis pretty heavily. So if you noticed multi-test analysis off to the left and you haven't been able to do anything with it, it might be because you don't have the right to get started. And I'll talk about that here in just a little bit. So as we explore multi-test uh, analysis, I'm not going to take a super deep dive. If you want a more in-depth explanation of how multi-test analysis works, I highly recommend you go look at our YouTube channel and find the multi-test analysis webinar we did several months back. But as a quick overview, multi-test is on the left navigation right underneath single test if you're an Aware Premium customer. If you don't see single test or multi-test, then you're not an Aware Premium customer and you might be able to reach out like Armando said to sales at edgeofory.net in the chat. <clears throat> and as we dive in, you might also notice hey, multi-test has some of these progress profiles. I can go click on these and start playing right away, or maybe it's empty. And if it's empty for you, then you probably need to start making progress profiles. Making progress profiles is controlled by a right. So if you don't see create up here at the top, where I'm kind of circling my mouse, then you don't have the right and you might need to ask for it if you feel like you're one of those administrators that needs such access. Then we get into creating those progress profiles. We see some common vocabulary from my example on the spreadsheet a second ago. I've got achievement levels one through five in this. Well, with each one, you can use as many as few or as few as two achievement levels or as many as six achievement levels. Six is really handy if you really want to get in and keep to that star um, low high for did not meet and low high for approaches and then uh, meets and masters. But Going as few as two, you can really get to a point where you're dropping kids into achievement level buckets for met growth and didn't meet growth. Or maybe you do it into three buckets where I have students that need intense remediation, students that need moderate remediation, and students that need enrichment. So there's a whole lot of things that you can do in flexibility here. You're not beholden to the performance levels of the state test. Play with it, make them your own and make them unique to what your actual district's needs are. That's why we call them achievement levels instead of performance levels, because they're one, met to a common scale and two, adaptable enough to meet your unique needs in your district. Now, within multi-test analysis, we handle these types of tests, local tests, map tests, star, telepass and intro. We're looking to expand that in the future, so send in those feature requests for which test types you'd like to see it expanded to, because it's only with those feature requests we know what it is you guys need. <clears throat> this is an example of actually mapping that data to create your common scales. Before I was using a formula in the Google spreadsheet, now instead of a formula, I have a visual interface where I get to choose the metric I want. Notice that metric column in the center. I can choose for star, the performance level, the raw score, the scale score, any of those things that I want. And then with each subsequent test, I can choose between each of the metrics that are unique to that assessment. And then I get to start selecting either via drop down or punching in numbers that set those cut scores to where I need them to be to create my common scales for each achievement level. It's a quick and easy configuration where I'm not hidden inside of a formula I'm actually looking across an entire table about where all my cut scores are and how I'm going to lump these kids into the various buckets that they need to be put into. And then once you're done, you get something that looks a little like this. And I'm not going to dive into all four of the views that are available of multi-test, but the one shown right here is a district level um, kind of overview. And you can see with the colored bars going across, I've got all of my, uh, my assessments stacked top to bottom, and I can see at a glance there's probably one test, if you're looking at this, that stands out to you right now. It stands out to me because the blues, the heavier blues, are far heavier on the right side for that assessment than they are with the other assessments. Now, again, this is just a demonstration example. Um, this, the particular one is called May 2023 star, but it's randomized data. But even though it's randomized data, you can see the power that multi-test gives you right off the bat, where I have my achievement level showing me that kids are performing really well on that assessment and not as well on others. Now, that doesn't mean the assessment's good or bad right off the bat. It just means, hey, that's something interesting and I might wanna dig into that, right? 
And so you can use this context I'm getting from the achievement level spread to start asking really targeted and important questions. And then multi-test allows you to drill down that data to the school, teacher, and student level, assuming you have the rights to see that level of data. <clears throat> really powerful, even for the teachers, is also the individual student view. I showed this and highlighted this in the spreadsheet a second ago, where I was looking at the kids and the achievement levels from side by side across time. You can see the same thing right here, where I've got the kids and all the achievement levels for those assessments. So I can tell right off the bat, which of my kids are growing, which of my kids are stagnant, which of my kids are declining. And I can start making some really targeted, focused conversations about how to get those kids where they need to be. This is an example that I'll leave on the screen for just a moment of what a hypothetical achievement level setup could look like. And it's really important when looking at these to really ask yourself before setting it up, what is the actual purpose and goal of your progress profile? What subjects, grade levels, and test types do you need to include? What metrics do you need? And then how are those metrics aligned or not aligned? So as you look, notice when I'm using percent score or raw score for achievement level one, if we assume that achievement level one is the lowest bucket, we start with zero, implying that as I go from achievement level one to two, kids from 0% to 58% fall on achievement level one, kids from 58% to 72% fall on achievement level two, 72% to 83% fall on achievement level three, and then above 83% fall into achievement level four. The others, if you use a performance level, are a little more straightforward. I just picked the did not meet approaches, meets, and masters. Be careful with this kind of setup if you use a performance level, because if I only have four achievement levels, but I have six options in my dropdown, I might need to make six achievement levels. So just a tip to go through as you're setting these things up. And then here's where some of the stats comes in, some of the magic with the correlation. In multi-test analysis, I give you a leg up or we give you a leg up with predictive analytics. You can see the results of the correlation comparison on that summative assessment to the assessment you're comparing it to. So I select one assessment, maybe the star test, to compare all of the other assessments I've included, and then it pumps out a correlation value. Now the correlation values require local context for you to decide if that correlation is strong or weak. But if you're looking for a recommendation, typically anything over 0.5 is pretty darn strong. Anything approaching zero is a very weak correlation or no correlation. And then anything towards the negative end actually means that kids that performed really well on one test actually performed really poorly on the other. And kids that performed really poorly on one test performed really well on the other. When usually we like to see if kids performed really well on one test, they performed really well on the next test as well. So this is giving you just an idea of how strong are your tests matching up in performance to that summative assessment that you've chosen? And how predictive are they? Again, this is just a singular data point. Your local context is super important here because sometimes lack of alignment in the predictive analysis doesn't mean the test is bad. It just means the test purpose doesn't align for that statistic. So ask yourselves those questions all the time. I'm probably going to not ever put a beginning of the year assessment in here and then look at the correlation to the end of year star because you're not going to get a strong correlation at all. The purposes of those tests are really misaligned. So keep those purposes in mind as you're looking at those things. Then we have the predictive analysis achievement level comparison. This one's really powerful because right across the top, you can see the breakdowns from negative five to positive five, meaning each color and zone represents a drop of five, four, three, two, or one achievement levels from one test to the next, staying the same at zero, or an increase of one, two, three, four, or five achievement levels um, moving from one assessment to the other. Generally, the more predictive a test is, the less you're going to see wild shifts in your performance levels. So when I look at this one straight off the bat, I can tell that that math grade three district checkpoint, we have a lot of kids moving into the negative. And this is actually kind of vice versa right now in multi-test. The negative means that the kids climbed from that local test to the summative test. Uh, did I say that correctly, Armando? It might be backwards. There's a message in multi-test that actually explains that. I'll double check that a little later, but it's definitely right in there. Um, all of the grays that, and the light, light blue and the light, light, light pink. If I'm one achievement level from test to test, 
and I have really big stretches of those, that likely means that that assessment is really, really stable. And that's a good thing. Whereas if I have a lot of the darker colors on either side, that means the assessment is not as stable when doing the comparisons. And it's an interesting piece of data for me to go ask questions. So where might I want to go dig further if I have more questions? I might want to go into single test. In single test analysis, we recently added test analytics. And as I talk about test analytics, I want to get really, really purposeful. So I'm going to read word for word a few things off of a couple of slides. Disclaimer when using analytics. The statistics in single test analysis do not include considerations for assessment validity. Practitioners, you guys, you establish validity by carefully choosing questions and deliberating on results. The warnings, thresholds, and interpretations of the statistics provided in single test analysis are for suggestive purposes only, and educators' actions should take into account all available information. Sample size. Do not rely on statistics with very few students in the data set. There can be varying thresholds for different situations on this, but a very general but not concrete example would be to use the calculations with caution if there are 50 to 100 students in the sample. And if there are fewer than 50, it might be a good idea to not rely on the statistics for any important decision making. And then local context. I keep hitting this. Apply local context whenever possible. Any one of these statistics alone is a vague data point that does not take into account the content of the assessment or the context of the district and the purpose of the assessment. For example, questions that are spiraled into an assessment from a previous content may throw several calculations off, skewing the test's reliability and offering atypical difficulty discrimination values and correlation values. However, spiraling questions in from a previous content can be a valid assessment practice. So use that context to help you decide if you really need to worry about some of the interesting flags if they come up at all. These are really important context questions that inform the last slide. Why are you giving the assessment? What behaviors and patterns associated with instruction in the classroom impact that? How many students have taken that assessment? How well prepared were the students to take that assessment and how many standards are included in the assessment? I'm gonna stay here for just another second and say, if I'm looking at a beginning of the year assessment in the analytics, it's very highly likely that due to the nature of a BOY test, the kids haven't learned that content. So some of the metrics, such as the correlation, are going to be wildly flagged because the kids' performance spikes and falls and climbs and spikes and falls again from question to question because they haven't learned the content. Keep that in mind when looking at this because a beginning of the year assessment is naturally going to do that, whereas an end of the year assessment likely wouldn't do that as much, and unit assessments might do it even less. That's not a rule of thumb. It's just an idea of how to provide context to the numbers that you're seeing. So here are the stats you actually get in the analytics. You, they're separated into two sections, the test level analytics and then item level analytics. At the test level, we look at reliability, skew, and the standard error of measurement. We have a 20 minute or 25 minute webinar on our um, uh, YouTube channel that goes into a deep dive into each of these things. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on them now, but if you're interested on a deep dive on what reliability, skew, and standard error of measurement actually mean and look like, please go look at that webinar. But as a really brief overview, reliability, you can almost think of it as stability. Is the performance across questions in your assessment stable? Then there's skew. Skew is about the uh, raw score distribution, looking at a bell curve. Is it leaning right? Is it leaning left? Is it more towards the middle? And your standard error of measurement is just how likely is what you're looking at actually like reliable and uh, what kind of error might be included. Then in the item level anal analytics, you get difficulty, the corrected item total correlation, and the discrimination index for every item. The difficulty is just a ratio of the number of points earned over the number of points possible for that question. It's just a general idea of how well did the kids do on this item as a whole. Then the corrected item total correlation is how well do we think, according to the math, this question is assessing what it should be assessing when compared to the rest of the test. Um, it's, it's how well does the scores on that question compare to the scores of the test. And again, getting a flag on the corrected item to total correlation doesn't mean the question's bad. It just means the content on that question and the way that it's scoring doesn't align with the overall scores of the test. So maybe it's a content thing. 
we see in situations where you have a test that covers, say, more than five standards where things get flagged because there's a lot of content on the test. Whereas a really more focused like unit assessment with three or fewer standards tends to have more correlation because that's the nature of that calculation. And then finally, discrimination index. That's do kids that perform really well in the test also perform well on this question? And do kids that don't perform really well in this test not perform so well on that question? We can use the analytics to help us flag interesting items, and then I can dive into the item response analysis and actually review the question. So on this GIF, um, I'm going to let it scroll through just a second. You'll see at the very top our raw score kind of distribution by item, uh, the item score distribution. And you'll notice one of them was really low, question 11. It was there for just a second. And because question 11 was so low or it was flagged on the analytics, I went and actually clicked on number 11 and I can view the question. And the beauty of single test analysis is it gives me a preview of the question even those TEI star 2.0 question types, and it shows me the answer distribution where I can really start digging into those, are there misconceptions in this? Are there distractors that are maybe too hard? Are there distractors that are a little too soft? Helps me look at every single student one at a time and see how did that student interact with the question when I click on their name? Really powerful stuff here to dig into and really start identifying what's going on with the test and why am I seeing what I'm seeing over in multi-test analysis and in the single test analytics. And that brings us to the end of our journey. Time to sum it up. We've looked at your overall analysis and the feedback cycle steps you need to for your assessment program. Multi-test analysis helps with this by helping you do student performance tracking, where you have multiple assessments pulled into a progress profile side by side to look at the performance over time and find patterns. You get to create a metric that matches across all assessment types. Then with the assessment review portion of it, we can ask these questions. How well did that local test predict performance on the star or on the map or the map to the star? How well historically have your local assessments prepared students for the end of year assessment? Then we can ask ourselves questions about assessment rigor, predictivity, and validity. And then finally, we can use it as a program evaluation tool. We can ask how well are the curriculum and resources that we're using preparing our students for that STAR test? And have we seen students grow over multiple years? It helps us answer questions about some of that resource allocation. All right. I've got a question coming in that uh, I need to take a look at. As I do that, I'd like to ask you a question. Which part of MTA are you most excited about? Is it the ability to configure your custom achievement levels, the various views, the graphs, or something other? Let us know. Ah, Benjamin, okay. For discrimination index, is it the top quartile versus the bottom quartile? <clears throat> we really... Uh, we don't break it up by a percentage. We look at the metric as a whole using a, and I have it on the online help guide that shows what formula we're using, but it's a different formula than the quartile approach. Good, bees, 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 the various views to analyze that progress. I like that. <laughs> Now I'm going to pass it back to Armando. Thank you guys for participating. All right. Thank you so much, Jeremy. If you need additional assistance on this or for other topics, please email training at eduphoria.net. And with that, I would like to thank uh, Jeremy for hosting. On behalf of today's team and all of Eduphoria, we would like to thank you for joining us on today's webinar about enhancing instructional program evaluations with specialized data tools. Have a great day.